Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Therapy and Theology with my friends, Proverbs 31 Ministries Director of Theological Research, Dr. Joel Mutamale, and Licensed Professional Counselor, Jim Kress. I'm so excited to be able to have these deep discussions with both of you. You've both benefited my life personally, and I couldn't keep it to myself because I wanted to bring all of this goodness to my friends. So before we get into our conversation, I want to remind you about the listener guide we're making available for each episode of season three. We know that these episodes can be a lot to digest. So this is a resource my team created to help you practically apply and continue to think about what you learn. Whether you're listening on the Therapy and Theology podcast or watching us on the Proverbs 31 Ministries YouTube channel, we've linked the free listener guide for you in the show notes. Now, in this installment of Therapy and Theology, we're gonna start off by talking about this big, but mm-hmm. now I don't mean physical butt, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't mean... know where you were going there. Okay, now we're getting real. <laughs> um, I'm talking about this big but question, which is, but doesn't God hate divorce? Uh, yeah. And so I think the reason I want to start here is because we eventually want to work our way to moving on when your marriage doesn't, because I just don't want to leave us sitting in all of this hard devastation of divorce. And I want I do want to talk about healing and moving forward and the grief process and then envisioning a new future for yourself. But let's deal with this first. God hates divorce. Yeah, where does this verse come from? Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. And how in the world did we get this translation from uh, from this verse? Now, I want to do a little bit of, um, of translation history. Uh, we'll be brief. If you want a more in-depth uh, kind of discussion, we actually discussed this in a previous uh, podcast season, season two, episode five. Uh, but I want to, I think it's really important that we understand that the original languages uh, in the Old Testament were written in Hebrew and some Aramaic, and the New Testament was Koine Greek. Uh, the nature of translation requires some level of interpretation, right? I'm Indian. I don't, y'all know that I'm Indian? Okay. I do now. That's good. <laughs> Just making sure everybody knows that I'm Indian. Um, and that's that? part of what makes you amazing. <laughs> yes. Remember you said yesterday, what was it, Indian Standard Time? Indian Standard Time, yeah, because I'm late to everything. So. I may or may not <laughs> last weekend have texted Joel and said, hey, where can I get butter chicken? Butter chicken, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Britt's going to make you some, so uh, oh, it's going to be the best. But... Um, one of the things early in my marriage that I didn't realize, my wife is white, I'm Indian, uh, my family's like from India, at home we spoke Telugu, my dad speaks Hindi, uh, is we, my when Brett came into our family, we ha- would have these jokes, and these jokes were in Telugu. And so my role in the family, I learned early on um, through some painful experiences, I'm actually supposed to translate, by the way. So that was, you know, marriage 101 in an intercultural marriage. Uh, but here's the challenge. When you have a Telugu joke, in a different language, and you have to translate it and interpret it into another language, English, the joke is no longer funny. And it kind of falls apart. <laughs> it falls apart, you yeah. know? And it's really, really devastating. So I say that to just point out, translation is difficult. We're doing the very best that we can, but we have to be aware of certain biases mm. that are present. Um, and I, I just want to just say, you can have a really good intent behind it, mm. but we have to be careful that we don't let our fear of what could be come in the way of what the text actually says, right? That's great. So what happens with the King James Version uh, of the Bible, which I know different people have different feelings about it, um, but when the King James Version was, uh, was written, there was a group of translators that were worried. Uh, and their worry was that if we translated this verse in Malachi 2.16 in a certain way, it would give license for everybody to just go ahead and go willy-nilly and just get divorced all over the place. So what they what they did was instead of just doing kind of a word-for-word word wooden translation, they made an interpretation. And the interpretation that they wrote, I'm reading from Malachi 2.16 in the New King James Version. It says, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. But here's the challenge. The Hebrew is not clear at all that that is what it's saying. In Hmm. fact, when we take the Hebrew of Malachi 2.16. And it's important to go back to the Hebrew because that's 
the, the original. original language. Right. So we're talking by the time King James comes along. I mean, this the 1800s, is, King, yeah. King, sometimes I think King James, you know, it's, it almost is like, well, was that part of the beginning? No, no. it came so, <laughs> so much, much later. later. We're talking about after uh, the Septuagint, after the Greek New Testament, after the Latin Vulgate with, with Jerome. I mean, we're talking past after the Middle Age. Like, it comes much, much later. So we're backing it all the way up. We're backing it back to original, original, original manuscript. Right. And this is translation challenge. What you do is you say, okay, if the Hebrew here is challenging, what's the first commentary on the Hebrew text? The first commentary of the Hebrew text is actually the Hebrew Bible written in Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint of Malachi 2.16 actually brings some clarification to what is Malachi getting at. What he's getting at is that God, who's a good father, Mm -hmm. who made his children in his image and likeness, his hatred isn't necessarily on the divorce, his hatred is actually connected in the Hebrew structure and the Greek structure of the verse towards the one who institutes and executes an unfaithful way of living that shows hatred against his wife, and in so doing that, he breaks the marriage contract. Mm. So where is, this is the kind of the interpretation question we have to ask, where is God's anger, his displeasure, his righteous um, justice aimed towards. It's not towards divorce. It's actually aimed at the one who causes an unjust divorce and actually is an offender and offends his wife um, in this situation. Now, the roles can absolutely be reversed as well. So when we look at a verse like Malachi 2.16, I think it's really important to to note that um, that God's hatred is, uh, or his anger, his displeasure, It's aimed towards actions that image bearers make that um, actually deface and dishonor the ideal of marriage that God intended. And the first and foremost way that that's done is when we dishonor each other. You know, I'll never forget when uh, you and I were studying this and some current text do give the closer interpretation to what you're talking about. And so I don't know the CSB version, but the version I read, it says, when a man hates and divorces his wife, he does violence against the one he should protect. That's right. And then there may be a little footnote that says, thus saith the Lord, God hates divorce. Yeah. But I, I was stunned because I thought, how many times have I been in conversations where people just have so accepted God hates divorce that it's almost made it feel impossible for a woman or a man who's in a marriage that has shifted from just being difficult to absolutely devastation. And that could be sexual devastation, it could be emotional devastation, it could be physical devastation, and you know, so so many devastating circumstances that can happen. And they push away keeping themselves safe because they think God hates divorce, and if I divorce, God hates me. me. And that's and, not at all hmm. what that text is saying. In fact, that uh, the Hebrew word for hatred or hate there is the Hebrew word shana, and that word could be synonymous for an un just divorce. Mm. And that's the word that's actually being used in the Malachi 2 passage. It's also the same word that's being used um, in Deuteronomy 24, uh, 1 through 4, and in uh, the Exodus passage that we uh, mentioned in the last episode. And so um, it's really important that we realize that God's hatred is towards sin. God's Mm. hatred, God's anger, his displeasure is towards actions that you and I make, that image bearers that humans make, that dishonor the image of God that we have graciously been bestowed. Jim, how many times has someone come into your office and they're dealing with some really, really heartbreaking circumstances Mm -hmm. in their marriage, and yet they kind of just want to push it aside because God hates divorce? Time and time again, that would be more of the standard of Christians who come in, um, going with just that English, if not the King James Version, um, translation and they have a belief system maybe uh, said fairly that was taught from a pulpit or they were mentored or someone said you know this is what the bible says so basically ixnay you know no divorce no matter what's going on um, i've even heard uh, on the practical level you can't divorce because of that verse now you know maybe there's room that you can separate and stay 
perpetually separated, what, like for the rest of your life. Right. But that would be more of the norm of what I hear from Christians when they come into my office. And, you know, I'll even say, I, and I said this out of a genuine commitment and, and how seriously I took my vows, but I remember saying divorce is not an option. Divorce mm -hmm. is not an option. And then decades later, I find myself in a situation that was absolutely no longer safe, sustainable, or even honoring of God's intention for marriage. And suddenly, divorce had to be an option And let for me, me speak to that as, as again, uh, in no way am I being pejorative with this statement. I have seen some who have been, and I understand that, well-known or high-profile pastors, speakers, leaders who have taught that through the years. And I, again, I, I get it. And then their adult child got married, even if it was not a sexual betrayal of the contract or covenant, mm -hmm. addictions that were un, you know, unrepented of, uh, verbal or emotional abuse so much that our friend Leslie Vernick does so much work around. And the, 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 there have been a number of key pastors, at least through the years, who have then stood up and said, you know what, uh, when it hits home and they have permitted, especially in some cases, their own daughter to say, I, I get it, I don't want to see my kid in this. And they have kind of stepped out of what they taught theologically. Sure. And it went more, quote, practically and said, it can often be different. And I have a statement that I use, and I hope it's not inappropriate to you all or anyone else, but I don't want my theology to ever ignore my reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is what, but I've seen some key people, I'm not going to ever sit here and name names. Uh, they're very well known, and their child got divorced, and suddenly they said, you know, it's just real. And mm -hmm. they may not even say, go back to the Bible, but they're like, uh, I don't, my daughter, is, she's been held captive there, and, and I, I give her my blessing to divorce. Mm -hmm. And, Jim, you know, I, there's a lot of honorable reasons to yeah. say that, mm -hmm. to say, um, you know, divorce is not an option, and I, I get the honorable side of it. Um, and at the same time, I think it's crucial that we get into the theological understanding and the therapeutic wisdom and both work together. I know you've got some more you want to say, Joel, and I want to also get to some of what Paul taught as well. Yeah, I just want to comment on what you said, Jim. Um, I typically say, I like to say a theology, I believe in lived theology, right? A lived yeah. theology. So I would say a theology that is unlivable is absolutely unhelpful. And what we're wow. trying to find, what we're finding is that because of theological dishonesty and because of um, weaponization of scripture and misunderstandings and misinterpretations, we're starting to find a theological framework that is unlivable. Mm. And in fact, and this is why I want to get to Paul, in fact, Jesus never lived it. <laughs> and if Jesus didn't live this theology out, why in the world are we trying to live mm -hmm. a theology out that is that would have been foreign to Jesus? I think you just woke up, but people were kind of dozed off or not or something. Jesus never lived it. I know my brain went, ooh when you said that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the the I would just wrap up this kind of conversation. I know we've got some questions that people have, um, have submitted, but, uh, you know, we started with the Old Testament in the episode before this. We then got to Jesus, which is super important, uh, but the New Testament was written uh, by, uh, the majority of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. What is the Apostle Paul doing? I read a commentary once, and I thought it was really funny. Um, they say that Paul is just plagiarizing Jesus, that all of Paul's letters are basically Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you know, regurgitated mm -hmm. in a lived way for these churches. Well, Paul's primary text on marriage and divorce is in 1 Corinthians 7. And I think it's really interesting. I'm just going to summarize this, that in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 5, Paul deals with emotional obligations that are included in divorce. What are those emotional obligations? We talked about it in the last episode. We talked about how um, the ancient rabbis understood that we have an obligation uh, in reciprocity, two people together, to emotionally provide stability, love, care, sexual intimacy, all of those things. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, he handles emotional obligations. Then interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 through 35, Paul deals with material obligations, material obligations. And this connects Paul's understanding 
of marriage and divorce, not to a Greco-Roman context, which by the way, the Greco-Roman context of divorce was even more wild than the time of Jesus, you know? Mm. Like now the Greco-Romans were like, hey, not only um, can just a man get a divorce and a woman can appeal a court in order to get a certificate of divorce, uh, in the Greco-Roman setting, anybody for any reason can get a divorce. All you gotta do is leave the house. You know, mm. and what Paul's saying is, wait a minute, we got to think about this differently. We got to uh, take steps, Lisa, like you said, and not leaps. And so I think that's super important. And both Jesus and both Paul make room, make allowance, not just for divorce, but then for the future of what that person's life could or ought to look like, and that includes the possibility of remarriage. I remember you saying um, a couple of A's to kind of bring it back and land it here. It's in the case of um, adultery, mm -hmm. abandonment, mm -hmm. abuse. I can't remember all of them, but I think that those are some good ways to kind of take all of this that we're talking about and put them in some categories to give yeah. people real thoughts around it. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's exactly right. Adultery, abandonment, abuse, um, and those things underneath it, it really what those things categorize is a defacing or dishonoring of the image of God. Well, wouldn't addiction, I know therapeutically, the will come one. under yeah. abandonment, though, would be if somebody's over there living in addiction, let alone the neurochemical processes yeah, and how it wires the brain, mm -hmm. and Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. I mean, it's more than just, I'm choosing to drink, drug, porn, sex, whatever. There's a sense that they will at least anecdotally and experientially, they will abandon the marriage because they won't be present. So this is super important. I'm glad, and I want you to talk more about this because one of the questions I'll often get is, um, what about addictions? Because it seems like Paul is pretty clear in 1 Corinthians 7 that abandonment is absolutely a viable yeah. option. And what you just said is so important. What do addictions do? They compromise our minds. They compromise our allegiance. It takes us from being outward focused in a healthy way to being primarily inward focused so that everybody else are pawns on a chessboard <laughs> for my life and I'm willing to sacrifice who I need to to get to you know the end of whatever the win is for me so an addiction is actually fleshed out conduit towards a type of abandonment that abandonment is typically emotional or it is it can be physical um, it can be sexual you see mm -hmm. and so these are how these categories actually are interrelated and flow together and then I go back to what Jesus says Jesus is like listen um, divorce is allowed Let's leave room for the possibility of true authentic repentance, but in the presence of a stubborn heart. And I think when we hear stubborn heart, we need to go back to the story of Pharaoh. Hmm. Pharaoh and the 10 plagues is a story of a stubborn heart. Each of those plagues mm -hmm. is actually a gracious act of a good God to lead Pharaoh to repentance. And it sounds like addiction. I'm just reading through the Old Testament in my read through the Bible. And I'm sitting there as I went through that in, in Exodus, I'm watching you know, you have the passage of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. I'm not getting aside to that. I'm just saying there was a sense of like, if you didn't know the story and hadn't watched Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd sit there and go, all right, I'll let, let my people go. And he would. And they're, they're taken off and all that. And I go, okay, he's repented. I think it's a classic model of addictions. And next thing you know, nope, don't nope. get him. So it's like, but at first, oh, they're changing. He, he softened his heart. This is Pharaoh with all of his power. And then that takes moments and he's right back saying, no, right I'm not going to let you it. do it. That's a yeah. classic picture of addictions. Yeah, and even, we won't get too deep into that, but I do a thing called Theology Talk Tuesday and somebody asked once, like, what is going on with Pharaoh? Because you mentioned, wait a minute, is Pharaoh hardening his own heart or is God hardening Pharaoh's mm. heart? The way that the Hebrews constructed the first instances of it is that Pharaoh is hardening his mm. own heart. And then the latter half is actually what God is doing is he's hastening or he's allowing or he's just reaffirming what Pharaoh has already committed his own heart to do. It's almost like turning himself over. You know, like That's turning exactly him over to what himself, it is. That's what Paul know, talks about. Is, we're going to turn the person over into their own sense so that their flesh might be destroyed, but maybe their soul is going to be saved in the outlook. So let's go to another big but question. Oof. Okay, so um, I feel like I should sing. God likes big butts, and I cannot oh, lie. Yeah. <laughs> but I won't do that. We're not going to do that. Okay. So um, the next but question is, but how do I heal? And then right behind that, but can I even move forward? And I think it's like, can I heal? What is this going to do to my kids? And is remarriage even permitted in mm, the Bible? That's a big one. Like, is dating and remarriage even permitted? And By the way, in my office, because you usually would throw and say, what about what do you see? So I'm just going to throw this in as a freebie. In my office, do you know that I see if there is a tight second place 
like my friend over here knows that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is now number two behind LeBron. That's we, right. This sports thing. All-time scoring <clears throat> but record. But if there is a tight number two, it is, and I, some days I think it's actually number one mm. on a practical level is, okay, yeah, divorced, dismorsed, whatever, whatever, but can I go on? And the myriads of teachings that have been out there and say, okay, but even if you divorce unfaithfulness, you are trapped, you cannot remarry. Right. Sometimes that's actually the number one question that I see in my office when divorce is being considered, can I even have a future? Like Which I think that's an important, that's, an, that's an honest question because yeah. for me, that what that question frames is, um, if I have a scale and I've got to put these two things on the scale, is the possibility of a life alone by myself mm -hmm. acceptable versus the harm and and chaos and the dysfunction of the relationship that I'm in. And so it's almost like, wait, is there even a way out? And if the way out means total loneliness and isolation, is that even worth it? Um, and for a long time, I think we've had answers that are, um, again, misunderstandings and misinterpretations uh, from the Bible. But I'm really curious on the healing one, because I think the healing one actually needs to be the first question that needs to be answered. And wow. then we can talk about uh, this is my Joel Pastoral hat. Yeah, we I gotta agree heal with first you. before we get to the possibility of remarriage. 100%. Because if your healing is contingent on the possibility of remarriage, Joel with my pastoral hat is going to be like, that's a problem too. So I can just speak from experience and really through Jim's wise counseling. Um, I, I knew I did not want to be a divorced woman. And I knew that because the issues that I had faced— um, in the last part of my marriage lasted so long, there was a lot of healing that needed to happen. And I believe that because I was with Jim at the beginning of discovery and through the devastation and through, in my situation, an attempt to reconcile and mm -hmm. renew our vows and then devastation again, I, I had been doing counseling all along. And still, when it finally ended, and I knew I was done, and that was a hard place for me to get to. I remember sitting in Jim's office and, and telling him, Jim, I literally, in this moment, you said every woman has a breaking point, and I remember mm. it took me forever to get there. Sure. But when I finally got there, I remember this breaking inside of me. It was almost like a physical feeling. And so I went and, and had a session with you, and I remember saying, Jim, does that breaking now mean that I'm broken? forever. Mm. And I remember you saying something like, Lisa, that, I don't think that was the moment that you broke. I think that was the moment you healed. healed. Mm -hmm. And it was such a profound moment for me. Now, was there a tremendous amount of grief? Absolutely. Of and at that point, it wasn't so much that I was grieving the loss of this person, because I think I had grieved that all along. It's like cancer. Know? A lot of people have said there's a loved one was dying of cancer. They, that's different than someone getting hit in a car wreck and they die. And it's there, but it's like, I've been grieving all along and sometimes the death, even the death of a marriage, can be a relief. Yeah, and I wouldn't say it was necessarily a relief, but I think the greater source of my grief, certainly I grieved losing this person because I would built a life with this of person, course. you know? But the grief was over, I didn't want to be a divorced woman. And and the other part of the grief, what is this going to do to my family? And the other part of my grief is now I'm 50, and now what does the rest of my life look like? Right. You know, I loved being a wife. I loved the sense of security and safety and stability of a good marriage. And, and so what does this mean? So my grief was pretty massive, but it was around moving forward. And and am I going to carry this terrible feeling in my heart forever mm -hmm. and ever? And I remember you giving, again, a lot of wise advice. <laughs> but you told me one time, grief is like a river. You have to get in it. And you have to get in the boat and let it take you where it yep. needs to go. And that's going to take time. Mm. And I remember asking, how much time? That's the number one question. How long? Okay, so remember through the Old Testament how long, O oh Lord, was perpetually being asked. All right, so, nothing so new here. how long? <clears throat> as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. And you know, Elizabeth Kubler Ross and many of our viewers and listeners will know that name who studied grief and the stages of grief. We now know more, and with a hat tip to her and her incredible research and observation, but the idea that grief is often cyclical 
and you come back around and then, you know, the grieving in the loss of the nuclear family, meaning mom, dad, there's a divorce, even if kids are an adult, they will never be like that again. Uh, feeling the grief because you're an incredible mom, I know that for a fact. And what if my kids are grieving, they're having a hard time. And if they are not ready to move on, or just as you've said so well, grieving that you were in that for all those years and saying, so it's come to this. Mm -hmm. How long does it take? If you get in the boat, I use the canoe in the river and go with it, it might cycle around. But the final part of that is true acceptance and true grief and mental health and spiritual health and relational health is a commitment to reality at all cost. And mm -hmm. to say, yeah, it's there, but I grieve not as those, amen, who have no hope. That's right. That's right. Well, and part of the grieving process, too, was I remember thinking I stayed in a situation that I probably shouldn't have stayed in for quite as long mm -hmm. as I did. And I think there were very noble reasons I stayed, but there were also some unhealthy reasons I stayed. Sure. And I needed to work on me. I needed to work on what were those healthy tendencies that that aided to the good parts of my marriage, but what were those very unhealthy tendencies that kept me attached in a situation that, you know, I really, I really needed to probably separate sooner. And and so I remember just thinking I have to work on myself and and you wisely said Lisa give yourself a year post divorce just give yourself a year. Well there's research around that too at least 6 months to just get in therapy process the facts and impact of what went on. You had we were talking about post divorce regret. You're speaking right now of what I'm calling post marital regret. That's different you said what didn't see that coming which is did I stay in this thing too long? Mm -hmm. You don't need an answer for that. You don't have mm -hmm. to have the answer, but it's a contemplative thing of saying, hmm, did I stay? And, and, you know, we'll get to more about forgiveness, and we've already done that, but to forgive myself, to cancel that debt and say, you know, maybe I did. Mm -hmm. Maybe I stayed in it too long and say, and now I move on. Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't have any desire to date at all. I, I couldn't, it, people would, talk to me about it and I just couldn't even yeah. process it. I couldn't even think about it. It was it was unfathomable to me. And again, this is my experience. This isn't going to be everyone's sure. experience. So I did give it a year and I realized, nope, I need more time. So I gave it six more months and then um, we had a therapy session or with my kids. And you know, I was trying to figure out, could I be ready? Could I be healed enough? Um, and then my kids stepped in and they they weren't ready. And it's not that my kids dictate what I do, but because family is so important to me. Um, I asked myself the question, could I give six more months? Absolutely. And so I wound up giving two years before I would even consider, you know, the thought of moving on. And moving on for me was so much bigger than just, am I ready to go on a date? Moving on meant, have I done the work to where I no longer need another person to help me get through this, but rather I'm freed up to have the ability to want someone if, well, if so another well, person right. came along. Mm -hmm. And after two years, I finally reached that place where I felt like, I've done this with God. I've done the work emotionally. I've done the work theologically. And now I feel free. It's not that I need someone else, but I feel free to want the right person if they came along. And I reckon to vet the right person one day if they came along to trust. But I already know I, I'm cheating. I know the answer, right? But to, for you to say, okay. Uh, I, I want to be able to trust but verify. I want to be able to, when someone shows you who they are, so many things we've talked about, and here's your chance, St. Paul, Philippians 4, to go put into practice. Yes. And that practice is <laughs> very important. And I remember, I have to be careful how I say this, because if I get it wrong, it'll sound really awful. But <laughs> I remember Jim saying one time, um, Lisa, back then, in your 20s, your picker, was broken. See why well, I have to be very careful. I would say that, yeah, right? right. I use and that all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, but he also said, when you know better, you do better. And I think now I'm able to so much more quickly see red flags or to acknowledge 
this person's wonderful, but this this is not what I want. And for the first time, I think in my adult life, I was able to take a step back and remember I have needs, not demands, but I have needs That's that right. must be considered. And I I can decide what I want and not settle and not choose another person because it's convenient, because I'm lonely, but choose another person because it's right. So that leads right over to our other theological question. Mm. What does the Bible say about remarriage? Because if you're going to date, you're not dating just to date, or at least that that's not my intent. Yeah. Would it be inappropriate if I do a drum roll here? Because I cannot wait to hear what, uh, you, know, what yeah, do you have sure. to say here. Sure. This yeah. is a big one. <laughs> this is a big one. Um, and, you know, I think it's important, at least that I do say that I remember when I first started really researching and studying this, that there are different positions on this. That good um, people, good, good people theologians that disagree love on. Jesus, that we would sit around yep. a table and have coffee and, um, and agree on 80% of so much. And then 20% say, you, you made an interesting argument. This is how I'd say it. You, know, you made an interesting argument. I'm unconvinced at the end of it. And so I just want to highlight that, that you may be in a situation where you hear somebody that's a, tr a trusted pastor or a ministry friend that um, has a different view on it, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, what I would suggest, though, is that we know the biblical text enough so that we can get back to the primary source, consider what does the Bible say, what does Jesus say, what does the Apostle Paul say, and allow that to be a framework of consideration for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give us where I have landed personally, based off of my study of Scripture and the, the Jewish kind of Old Testament context, and, um, and there are different opinions, like I said. And I think it's important for us to again say what we often say here on Therapy and Theology. We're not going to tell you what to think, but we're going to give you a lot to think yes, about. I love that. And we just want to educate from a biblical standpoint and from a therapeutic standpoint, um, educate you so that you can have really good information to process all of this through. So yeah. go ahead. I think in today's modern scholarship, pretty much everybody is going to say, yes, divorce is possible. Um, yes, divorce at times may even be necessary, depending on the situation and circumstance. Now, the question of remarriage becomes a hotly um, discussed aspect of it. Where I've landed, is that it seems really clear. Because I want to look at the scriptures as one cohesive story, hmm. as one cohesive telling an uh, unveiling of hmm. God's ideal, right? And in light of that, when you look at a passage that we've studied pretty a lot, I mean, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, it speaks of a marriage um, a, a marriage contract, but then it talks about a di divorce certificate. This is a very specific certificate mm -hmm. that was true for the ancient Israelites. And I was actually doing some research. I've got his book with me, Dr. David Instone Brewer, who is a legendary Old Testament scholar that's done a lot of work in this area. So I'm building on his research. I'm, I'm sourcing and citing it. He makes this observation. This is wild. That in the ancient Near Eastern world, there was never such a thing as a certificate of divorce for any other nation in that area. <laughs> this really? was unique and novel for the Israelites. Hmm. Why? This is the big question, why? Because God saw it so important that in a patriarchal society that women had safety. They had security and they would have stability in their lives in the worst case scenario where there was a death of a marriage, right? So what was that certificate of divorce? That certificate of divorce was basically what the husband would write and give to the woman so that in having that, she would get her dowry back. She would have some financial stability. In fact, there's some uh, rabbis that talk about in the Mishnah, we talked about this before, that um, some husbands would would want to have, I think the phrase is ha have their cake and eat it at the same time. Have their cake too. and eat it too. Yeah, there we go. Joel, I, Joel always, <laughs> this is this is a thing with Joel. This is a thing. It really is. Mixed the, metaphors. Or, or partial or metaphors. Or partial metaphors, you know? <laughs> um, and I think, so, so actually, I, I don't think I know, based off of the Mishnah, that there were men that wanted to have their wife to, to still be there um, and live reckless and wild, you know? Uh, it sounds and, like today. I mean, right? Gracious. And so what the rabbi said to protect the woman was they actually instituted financial penalties hmm. upon the man because the woman would be stuck. If the husband did not write out the certificate of divorce in a very specific way, then it would wow. put her in a place of total... Uh, victimization, really. I mean, it was bad. So the rabbis put into a place a financial system in order to penalize them. The longer they waited, the more they would have to give back as interest basically on top of the dowry. 
This is wild. It and is. I have the citation, uh, the citation as well. There is a couple instances. I don't even know if I should be saying this on the podcast, but because it's footnoted, I can say it. Um, there are some instances where these dudes were so wild and they were so stubborn that the rabbis were like, we don't know what else we're going to do. So you know what they decided to do? They whipped the men. <laughs> Well, they Nehemiah did that. He took out and started beating and people. Started, yeah. So the, literally, the And we are says, not endorsing. And we're not no, endorsing we're just, that, but I'm whipping. Is, I'm just descriptive. saying. I'm just saying that this is how serious the ancient context was so that it would put the person in a position to finally honor his wife because he has dishonored her for so long that he would give the certificate of divorce. Now, the same idea of the certificate of divorce, why was it so important for them? Because the certificate of divorce gave the woman the allowance, the opportunity to get married again. Hmm. This is massive. In, in that world, in that setting, if the dowry, if the financial stability that she had was not substantial enough, it could be really devastating for her. She'd get that back? She would have that, that sounds back. like a modern day, a bit of a prenup. Exactly. Doesn't it? I mean, that's it, just interesting. You said it, not me. So, uh, well, I said but it yes, sounds that's, like, that's exactly yeah. right. And so that is taking place. And what it does is it gives the woman the freedom, mm. it gives her the opportunity, it makes it a possibility. Not really important here. Mm. It's not com like a compulsion, it's not demanded, it's not mandatory. It's the, it, This is an echo of what Jesus and Paul do. It is not a command, but it's an allowance for what is best for that woman in that situation. There's actually a lot of evidence uh, in the later on in the Greco-Roman world that many women who went through a divorce like this would actually choose to stay single mm -hmm. because they had more freedom, they had more opportunity. They didn't want to be put back into a situation where they could um, be uh, a victim again. And so that takes place as well. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 39 through 40, uh, this is, he says that the woman who, remember we talked earlier through material and emotional neglect, where basically their threshold for pain is just too much, that there's unrepentant sin, there's a stubbornness of heart. In those situations is what Paul says. Paul says that the woman may remarry to whomever she wishes only in the Lord. This is really interesting. Paul is quoting a first century divorce certificate that said, you are free to marry any Jewish man you wish. What does Paul do? Instead of saying Jewish man, he inserts a condition. And that condition for the Christian is in the Lord. And in a sense, you can get married, but it needs to be a person who loves Jesus, who mm. is a, uh, a fellow um, believer. Believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say, and not just checking the Christian box, but truly Substance. processing their yeah. life and living their life through a truth-based belief in Jesus and that they know the truth and live the truth. Yeah. And they process their life and any decisions being made through biblical wisdom. So what happens here is, and Lisa, we've talked about this before, and Jim, a lot of times when it comes to the scriptures, we want policy, not principles. Hmm. I want A plus B to always equal C. I wish the Bible is like a concordance that I can That's just open up to theology, be. That's a recipe theology. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not like the biblical authors and God himself, like, like refuse to do that for us. What they want is to give us principles to, to help it flesh out in the specific context that we're in. So I think for this conversation particularly, where I would want to end it with and, and uh, just reinforce it is that based off of how I've seen the text, how I think there's strong scriptural evidence, um, it's present in the Old Testament, the rabbis understood this way, Jesus understood this way, and Paul understood it this way, which is like the weight of evidence for me, is that remarriage is absolutely a, and I'm going to use a specific word here, is absolutely a possibility. Hmm. Now that possibility, in my opinion, and Jim, I'm, I know you've got a lot on this, and Lisa, um, what is wise? What is healthy? What is appropriate? Mm -hmm. How has God individually wired you? What is the testimony of witnesses of the people that do life with you? That's so good. You know, um, we live increasingly in an individualistic society that's thinking about me, myself, and I. And yet the biblical text and the, and, and the way that the family of God is oriented is a we, not a me. And so we have to consider all of these things on, uh, is it not just possible, but in this situation, is it wise? Is it healthy? Is this the way that God has designed and, and wired me? And what is what are the steps towards that? I think that's really crucial, and part of that really even getting to know the answers of those questions requires solid theological and therapeutic work. 
And so that's part of the reason why we want to do these two podcasts is to make sure that you have the biblical wisdom mm -hmm. and some of the therapeutic insights for healing and moving forward. Jim, in the last little bit of our time here, I, I want to know how, how does someone know that they are healed? Like, how do they know, like, let's just take a woman, for example. How would she know that she's healed enough to even consider going on a date or looking toward a future relationship? Well, you changed the question right in the middle of it. I love that. How do I know that I'm healed? I believe, this may surprise you, uh, I believe very little in what I call the ED, po the policy of ED, ED, putting the ED at the end of a word. I am healed. I believe in healing and levels of healing. How do I know that I've had enough healing? Because to say, am I healed? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I really don't believe a lot of us are healed totally till heaven. That's great. I go back and land where uh, where old Joel took us over there, and that is is verse uh, 40 of 1 Corinthians 7. And I just love Paul comes and says, all right, he's like being counselor here himself, or as you said, pastoral. Yet in my judgment, the wife is actually happier if she remains as she is, single, mm -hmm. not remarried, and I think, too, that I have the Spirit of God. So I want to take that, and the word I use here is a bridge. I use it all the time, and that is this marriage ended. We've called that the death of a marriage. Take time to grieve. Just take time, not just you took time to see if the spouse would change. Take time now for yourself. Keep, as the flight attendants say, putting the oxygen mask on yourself. And to remain single, at least for a season, to be able to get to know yourself. There's one state of being when you are alone. The old spiritual uh, writer Henry Nouwen said this, that when you're alone, do you go to loneliness? I'm so lonely. And that makes great codependent love songs. Or you to go? do you go to solitude, an attitude of being solely by yourself? We know that as solitude. Mm -hmm. So to be with myself, to get to know myself, and as though this contract this, this, that I've had here terminates and ends. We could go way in the ditch here by talking about all the sports contacts, uh, contracts, right? But And I'm not trying to, but it's, it's we use it in the business world all the time. Trust but verify. So to look and say, I have a new contract with myself and with God. Take the time to get to know myself mm -hmm. and to process that. And what I find as, oh, I wouldn't say a litmus test, but it's, it's uh, interesting data to me, is that for a woman or a man, but for a woman to get out of a marriage, appropriately work her way through it and get out, and really soon, which is normally, got to tell you what I see, even with the Christian clients I work with, is within a month or two already on into dating sites. I'm not against that at all, but very quickly. They didn't have a moment. Put yourself in therapy. Go work on that. If you can't afford therapy, watch more therapy and theology. It was your original mm -hmm. vision. Talk to some wise yeah. counsel, some good friends, and say, I need to be alone to be with myself. And Blaise Pascal, which we've said before, said all of our problems stem from the inability to sit alone with yourself quietly in a room. So getting to know yourself, do some journaling and have your own patience. And then back to our picker word is to get my picker healthier and healthier than when you are doing that backstage work and you come out on the front stage, trust but verify, I know this about you. You've got this personal board of directors, not Proverbs 31 and all that, but some key women, and probably many of them, say, Lise, come on now. Or you say, here, what do you see? Me, you have Joel, we're here with you. That idea that everybody can have people like that and say, well, here's what he said, here's what he did. Trust but verify. I think it just takes time. Take that bridge of being with yourself. And this is going to sound weird. Take the bridge to date yourself. Get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. so good. I love what you say about the personal board of directors because this is true. And I probably have more people on my personal board of directors than yeah. most people would. Certainly these two are on it, but I do have some really amazing girlfriends and we do life. We do everyday life together. We're processing life in the morning. We're processing life after work. We get together and we play games and cards and we just do life together. And so when I started going on dates and um, it's, it feels weird to say that. But when I started going on dates, if I went on 
a couple of dates with a person. And I thought, maybe, you know, I'll keep going on dates with this person. Um, I would say, we need to have a conversation with my friends so that my friends could ask this person any question they wanted. And then if I kept going on dates, then I would say, hey, we need to get together with my friends because mm -hmm. my friends know me. Um, maybe even in some ways, maybe a little bit better even than I know me at That's times. Fair. And um, Were you doing this literally? Yes. Like if you say, hey, dude, you know, really, uh, it's time now to meet the board. A yes, absolutely. I, I know, I know for 100%. a fact, but I'm like, going, wow. Yes. Y'all can do this. Yeah. And yeah. so it was, it was important to me. And I mean, even flying my friends out of town to meet mm -hmm. this person and are, you know, then flying them out of town to meet someone else, you know, when that relationship Which is didn't what work every out. company in America and the world will do to come in, you meet with the board, you meet with the CEOs, you think about this HR thing, and we need our own individual HR thing here and a board and an HR director, maybe it's somebody outside of us. We do this by the hour in America. Churches do this. You're not just gonna pop in and be the new pastor. The search committee, it's right. done everywhere else, and then we get in a relationship like this after a divorce, looking at dating or remarriage, and we go, oh. It's like, no, it's done by the hour. Mm -hmm. And is it hard, and is it complicated, mm -hmm. and do I feel incredibly weird at times, <laughs> you know, being, um, I don't know, I'm 53 years old. Does it feel weird? Yeah, it feels weird. But um, it is possible. And so again, no, no part of the show is trying to tell you what to think or what to do. We just want to give you a lot to think about. So we believe in you and we're so grateful to bring this time and this information and this wisdom to you. And I hope it really helps.